Welcome to our video on puberty. Let's get started. Puberty in girls starts anywhere from 8 to 13 years of age, while in boys it occurs from 9 to 14 years of age. With this in mind, let's define some terms. Adrenarche denotes initiation of adrenal androgen production, for example, androstenedione. Gonadarche is activation of the gonads and predominant production of testosterone in boys and of estrogen in girls. Telarchy is the onset of breast development. Menarchy denotes the onset of menses. And finally, pubarchy is the beginning of pubic hair development. Now let's talk about the sequence of changes during puberty. In girls, adrenarchy is followed by gonadarchy, telarchy, growspurt, pubarchy, and finally, menarchy. In boys, adrenarchy is followed by gonadarchy, pubarchy, growspurt, and androgenic hair growth. It's worth noting that the first visible sign of puberty is breast development in girls and testicular enlargement in boys. In order to track puberty in boys and girls, we use Tanner stages, which is also known as the sexual maturity rating scale. There are five stages in the scale for both boys and girls. This scale depicts independent development of breast, genitalia, and pubic hair. In other words, these three criteria are assessed independently of each other. For example, the patient may have Tanner stage 1 pubic hair and Tanner stage 3 genitalia at the same time. Here we see the different Tanner stages. As you can see, in stage 1, there is no pubic hair either in boys or girls, and girls have a flat chest with raised nipples. In stage 2, pubic hair starts to develop, breast development starts in girls, and testicular enlargement occurs in boys. Stage 3 is characterized by coarsening of the pubic hair penile lengthening, and breast enlargement. In stage 4, coarse pubic hair covers the whole pubis but does not extend to the inner thighs. The penis widens in boys, and the areolae raise in girls. In the final stage, stage 5, the pubic hair spreads to the medial thighs, the penis achieves an adult size in boys, and the breasts reach the adult size in girls. All right, with this in mind, let's talk about precocious puberty. This is the development of secondary sex characteristics before the age of 8 in girls and before the age of 9 in boys. It's divided into several types. We have central, also known as gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty, and peripheral, which is also known as gonadotropin-independent precocious puberty. Finally, there are also benign pubertal variants and obesity-related precocious sexual development. Let's discuss each of these in more detail. Central precocious puberty is precocious puberty with high GnRH levels. Idiopathic central precocious puberty is the most common variant of this condition. However, CNS tumors can also secrete excessive GnRH. The pathophysiology includes early activation of the hypothalamic hypophyseal gonadal axis. Consequently, the levels of GnRH, FSH, and LH are all high, which in turn results in high testosterone and estrogen levels. The diagnosis of central precocious puberty occurs using an x-ray of the hand and wrist to estimate the bone age of the patient. If the bone age is greater than the chronological age by more than one year, then we measure hormone levels, such as FSH, LH, estradiol, and testosterone. An increased baseline LH indicates central precocious puberty right away because LH is normally produced by the anterior pituitary. If LH is normal or low, we perform a GnRH stim test which differentiates central from peripheral precocious puberty. If GnRH administration increases the LH levels, it indicates central precocious puberty due to the predictable effect of GnRH on LH levels. The treatment is with GnRH agonists like luprolide. Exogenous GnRH administration will downregulate GnRH receptors on the pituitary gonadotrophs and therefore will reduce FSH and LH levels. As a result, estrogen levels will be decreased in both girls and boys. Since estrogen closes the epiphyseal growth plates, preventing further linear bone growth, GnRH agonists will allow the patients to grow in height. All right, let's try a question. A seven-year-old boy is brought by his mother to the physician for a routine well-child exam. The patient's height is in the 98th percentile for his age. The physical exam shows increased body and facial hair, as well as testicular enlargement. The mother has recently noticed that her son's voice sounds deeper than normal. What is the best next step in the diagnosis of this patient? All right, this is a seven-year-old patient who's presenting with increased body and facial hair, testicular enlargement, and a voice that's deeper than normal. Since these secondary sex characteristics developed before the age of 9 in this patient, he may have precocious puberty. 
So the best next step in the diagnosis would be an x-ray of the hand and wrist to evaluate the bone age. If the bone age is greater than the patient's chronological age, true precocious puberty is likely and further workup is indicated. All right, let's move on to peripheral precocious puberty. This is the precocious puberty with low or normal GnRH levels. Causes of this condition can be classified into two large groups, increased peripheral sex hormone production or exposure to exogenous sex hormones. Peripheral endogenous sex hormone production can be observed in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, an ovarian cyst, a Sertoli-Leydig cell tumor, McCune-Albright syndrome, dysgerminoma, and seminoma. Dysgerminoma and seminoma can also cause this due to HCG production, which I'll explain more in a minute. On the other hand, exposure to exogenous sex hormones can include either androgen or estrogen. Patients may be exposed to these, for example, with using oral contraceptive pills, hormonal creams, or other medications. Of all of the types of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the two to keep in mind with regards to peripheral precocious puberty are 21-hydroxylase deficiency and 11-beta-hydroxylase deficiency. 21-hydroxylase deficiency is accompanied by hyperandrogenism with hypotension and hyperkalemia, and this is due to low mineralocorticoids. On the other hand, 11-beta-hydroxylase deficiency is associated with hyperandrogenism with hypertension and hypokalemia, and this is due to excessive mineralocorticoids. An ovarian cyst or a Sertoli-Leydig cell tumor can also cause this by producing excessive estrogen or testosterone, respectively. Moving on, let's briefly talk about the other causes of peripheral precocious puberty. This includes McCune-Albright syndrome and ovarian dysgerminoma or testicular seminoma. McCune-Albright syndrome is a genetic condition associated with mosaicism that causes unilateral, sharply contoured cafe au lait spots polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, and peripheral precocious puberty. Ovarian dysgerminoma and testicular seminoma produce HCG, which activates the LH receptors, resulting in increased androgen production. Here we see the cafe au lait spots that are characteristic of McCune-Albright syndrome. Due to their sharp edges, these spots sometimes resemble the coast of Maine. This is an x-ray image showing central hyperlucency in the bone consistent with fibrous dysplasia. This is characterized by replacement of the bone with fibroblasts and collagen. As you can see, the diagnosis of peripheral precocious puberty is very similar to that of central precocious puberty. First, we perform an x-ray of the hand and wrist to estimate bone age. If the bone age is greater than the chronological age by more than one year, we then check the FSH, LH, estradiol, and testosterone levels. If LH is low or normal, we perform a GnRH stim test. If the patient has peripheral precocious puberty, there is usually no change in LH levels due to the negative feedback of peripheral sex hormones on LH. Abdominal pelvic imaging is warranted if a sex hormone-producing mass is suspected. The treatment is disease-specific. If a tumor is confirmed, then removal should be performed. And if it's being caused by congenital adrenal hyperplasia, this is treated with cortisol supplementation, which will decrease the effect of ACTH on the adrenal glands. All right, now let's move on to discuss benign pubertal variants. All of these are characterized by a certain isolated finding without other secondary sex characteristics. Precocious telarchy is an isolated breast development. Precocious pubarchy is an isolated pubic hair development. And precocious menarchy is initiation of menses without other secondary sex characteristics. And as the slide title implies, these are all benign. All right, let's try a question. An eight-year-old boy is brought to the physician due to rapid growth in height. The patient's mother noticed that he is growing faster than his siblings. The physical exam reveals axillary and pubic hair. Testicular enlargement is also noted. His vital signs include a blood pressure of 85 over 65 millimeters of mercury, a heart rate of 110 beats per minute, and a respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute. Laboratory findings are significant for a potassium level of 5.5. A 24-hour urine 17-hydroxyprogesterone is elevated. What is the best treatment option for this patient? All right, this is an 8-year-old boy presenting with rapid growth in height, axillary and pubic hair, and testicular enlargement. These secondary sex characteristics in a boy less than 9 years of age suggest precocious puberty. 
This patient also has hypotension and hyperkalemia, as well as increased 24-hour urine 17-hydroxyprogesterone. All of these findings and the age of the patient are consistent with the diagnosis of non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia due to 21-hydroxylase deficiency. The treatment for this is cortisol supplementation, which will negatively feed back ACTH and decrease adrenal androgen production. All right, now let's talk about obesity-related precocious sexual development. It has both central and peripheral pathophysiology. Obesity increases leptin production from adipose tissue. Leptin, in turn, increases GnRH secretion, which then activates the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. On the other hand, obesity also induces insulin resistance, which results in compensatory hyperinsulinemia. This can cause precocious puberty by stimulating aromatase in the adipocytes, as well as androgen production by the adrenal glands. High levels of insulin also inhibit hepatic synthesis of sex hormone binding globulin. All of these effects increase the sex hormone bioavailability, resulting in precocious puberty. Okay, now let's discuss delayed puberty which is defined as absent or incompletely formed secondary sex characteristics by the age of 14 in boys and the age of 13 in girls. Delayed puberty can be either physiological or pathological. Physiological delay is also known as constitutional growth delay. Pathological delay can be caused by hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, or malnutrition. We'll focus mostly on constitutional growth delay, as this is particularly high yield. However, we'll also briefly cover the others. So constitutional growth delay indicates delayed puberty and delayed bone age. The patient has a short stature, but normal growth velocity. In other words, bone growth starts later than normal, but it grows at an appropriate rate. Patients with constitutional growth delay usually have a family history of the same condition. The management is reassurance and waiting because this patient will most likely catch up with his peers. Normal adult height is usually achieved as well. Moving on, let's briefly discuss pathological delay of puberty. As I just mentioned, this can be caused by hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and malnutrition. Typical examples of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism include Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. Examples of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism include Kalman syndrome. And finally, examples of malnutrition disorders include Quashiercore and Marasmus. All right, let's finish up with a final question. A 15-year-old boy is brought to the physician for a well-child visit. His height is at the fourth percentile for his age. The physical exam shows Tanner stage 1 genitalia and pubic hair. An x-ray of the left wrist and hand reveal the bone age of a 12-year-old. The father recalls that he also started his puberty later than his peers. Serum, FSH, and LH levels are normal. What is the best next step in the management of this patient? All right, this is a 15-year-old boy who's presenting with a height that is in the 4th percentile for his age and Tanner stage 1 pubic hair and genitalia. Also, the bone age is that of a 12-year-old child. This presentation is consistent with delay of growth and puberty. Since his serum FSH and LH levels are normal, and his father also has a history of delayed puberty, this patient's diagnosis is most likely a constitutional delay of growth and puberty. So the best next step in the management would be reassurance because he will likely achieve adult height and normal secondary sex characteristics. And that concludes this section.